Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Positive Choices webinar series. Today is a very special session of this webinar series because we're going to talk about Sean McAuliffe's On the Source docuseries, and we are going to move the conversation forward from the docuseries. My name is Smriti Nepal. I am the project manager of Positive Choices, and I'm going to be facilitating this session today. Before I proceed, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognize their continuing connection to land, water, and culture. I'm currently on the land of the Dharaval people and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are based and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future. I would also like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So many of you would have watched Sean McAuliffe's On The Sauce, or at least would have heard of the show if you've been watching TV in the last few weeks. In the three-part docuseries, Sean took us through the history of drinking in Australia, what drinking culture currently looks like in Australia, and where the Australian drinking culture is headed. So to give you a little bit of context on this, I'll play you a clip from episode three. Australia's teens are drinking less, and that may be due to the rise of social media. When your drunken shenanigans can end up all over the socials, many are deciding it's wiser not to drink at all. Back at the turn of the millennium, 70% of teenagers surveyed had tried alcohol. Today, that figure is just 45%, making teetotaling teens the majority. So we have an expert panel with us today. These are four people who have had years of experience in the field of mental health and substance use research. We have with us Professor Murray Thiessen from the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use and NHMRC Center for Research Excellence premise based at the University of Sydney. We have Professor Steve Alsop from the National Drug Research Institute at Curtin University. We have Associate Professor Tim Slade, who is also based at the Matilda Center for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use, again at the University of Sydney. And finally, we have Dr. Sally Hunt, who you might recognize from Sean's show. Um, she is a clinical psychologist and senior lecturer at the School of Psychology at the University of Newcastle. Welcome all, and thank you for joining us on the panel today. So for the Next one hour, our panel of experts will answer questions that we have received from our audience. We will start off by answering questions that we have already received via email, and then we will move to any questions that we receive live. If you didn't get the chance to send your questions to us via email, please do send us your questions right now by adding your questions to the Q&A panel on your screen. So let us begin. So the first question we have is about the recently released National Drug uh, Household Survey. Tim, can you tell us what the report tells us, uh, tells us about adolescent drinking? Sure. So as you've just mentioned, uh, the most recent survey that has measured drug and alcohol use in the Australian uh, general population was carried out last year in um, 2019, and the results have just been released. Um, Overall, in the general population, we've seen a slight decrease in daily drinking and a slight increase in the number of people who class themselves as ex-drinkers. But when we focus in on the adolescents, we see that, uh, similar to those stats we just saw in that clip, 72% of kids aged uh, 14 to 17 report that they have uh, not, never tried alcohol. Um, and this rate has actually been uh, steadily and quite dramatically increasing since uh, 2001, um, but also appears to have leveled off since we last carried out this survey uh, three years ago. Um, we also know though that that uh, doesn't uh, kind of uh, capture all the drinking in the adolescent population. There are definitely subgroups who are drinking and are drinking at risky levels. And if we think about, um, you know, one of the common thresholds that we use is drinking uh, four or more drinks in one uh, 
um, occasion of drinking, we know from our most recent stats that around 8% of adolescents are doing that, um, at least monthly. Uh, this it also has reduced it over time, but still, you know, we're, we're, that, that's not a, an insignificant number. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so if they are, you know, like you said, if they are not drinking as much, do we know why they're not drinking as much as they used to? Yeah, I mean, that's a really, a, a really good question and probably a question that lots of people want the answers to. Uh, the first thing I'd probably say is it, it won't be any one single factor. Um, and the second thing to say is, you know, sometimes that's really hard to study from a research perspective. Probably what we need are really long-term studies that follow up uh, lots of people from different age groups and different generations over time for a long time to really get at that. But having said that, there, there are some um, suggested reasons and a really nice systematic review that was published last year has suggested that it might be related to the uh, uh, changes in lifestyle factors, similar to what we saw in that, that clip, um, in that young people these days have a, have a different uh, way of interacting and choosing to spend their leisure time and this might actually impact on uh, drinking behaviors much of much of their activity is carried out online these days and, and social interaction occurs online and maybe these are replacing some of the face-to-face -face interactions um, that adolescents are uh, have typically had in the past in drinking contexts but there are other possible hypotheses there have been changes to uh, the policy environment, there have been changes to the way alcohol is advertised. There is a suggestion that young adolescents might not be drinking as much, but might have substituted that with other drug use. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. One of the things that we think might be driving some of these changes are you know, changes in parenting practices that have occurred over the last 10 to 20 years. And there's, you know, quite strong evidence of links between um, parenting factors like parental monitoring, um, setting alcohol specific rules in a household, um, and reduced sort of rates of supply of alcohol to kids. And we, we are sort of wondering whether these things are driving some of the reductions in, in alcohol use amongst adolescents, but it's hard. There are lots of factors out there. Okay. Um, you, you touched on this uh, slightly in your answer to this, uh, but do we have a question about um, if people, if young people are not drinking alcohol, then is there any other drug that they are turning to? Can you um, shed a bit more light on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, that's sort of one of the, the uh, the explanations um, for what we might, for why, we, or, or one of the byproducts of this sort of um, behaviour of, of reduced drinking is that kids are choosing to use other illicit drugs um, and smoking um, as alternatives. Um, but really, that is not what we're seeing from our data. The the results from our surveys have suggested that there is more of a widespread reduction in alcohol and drug use over time, including smoking amongst young people. And maybe some of the other factors that come into play are an increased awareness of um, the importance of physical activity um, and those sort of behavioural um, lifestyle factors, which are, you know, driving some of these um, trends across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, and can you also tell us what the research says about the uh, relationship between parental supply of alcohol to adolescents and adolescent drinking. Is there any data that you can share with us on this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess um, one of the beliefs is that supplying alcohol to children early on in their adolescent years um, might teach adolescents to drink responsibly. Um, I've been heavily involved in a, a large longitudinal study that has in fact shown um, the opposite really, that supplying more alcohol to kids leads to uh, more binge drinking. Um, the more alcohol that is supplied, 
the higher the rates of um, uh, later binge drinking, but that relationship still seems to be there when we look at parents who, who supply their kids with just sips of alcohol as well. And this seems to be there also independent of a range of other kind of what, what are known as confounding factors, I guess, in that, in that relationship. So, you know, things like the quality of the relationship between um, kids and parents, the general level of risk taking amongst adolescents and, and those sort of personality factors, and also things like their association with peers who drink, all of that, putting that aside, there still does seem to be that kind of positive relationship between supply of alcohol to kids and, and later um, risky uh, drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting, Tim, thank you. Um, and this next question is, I uh, would put forward to Sally. Um, this is around parental role modeling. Uh, so do you think it is better for kids to see their parents drinking or not? A really good question. I think a lot of parents wonder about whether they should drink in front of their children or not drink in front of their children at all. And I mean, one of the obvious things that Tim's already alluded to is that parents are an enormous um, uh, model and, and influence on their children's future behaviour. So children will mimic what they see parents do. We know that when children see parents um, talk about having a favourable attitude towards alcohol, uh, coming home and saying, oh, I need that beer, or I need that drink, uh, demonstrating a role of alcohol within their life that looks like a good thing to do, that those kids are more likely to drink when they get the chance, mm -hmm. and also that they're more likely to misuse alcohol when they hit 17 and 18. So um, certainly being exposed to, to drinking can have negative consequences for children. However, we also know that children learn how to drink in moderation and how to... Um, set boundaries around their drinking from seeing that in their parents as well. So it's important that parents talk to their children mm -hmm. about the choices that they're making with their own drinking, why they're stopping at one drink or two mm -hmm. drinks, um, why they're choosing not to drink at all sometimes or not at all, so that children actually can understand that behaviour and put it in context a bit better and hopefully make better choices down the track. Okay. Um, this next question is from a grandparent. So I will read out the question. Um, so it says, I am 65, recently stopped alcohol completely. I have three grandkids between the ages of seven to 11 and both their parents drink. How can I talk to my grandparent, grandsons? Okay, so and you're in, a, in an interesting position there that I'm sure many, many grandparents around the country can, can relate to. Um, and, it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be when you've got children who are drinking, but it can happen within um, parents where one drinks, one doesn't, or where there are many influences on a child. I think the first most important thing is to be honest and open in communicating in an age appropriate way. If we're talking about a seven year old, we'll be saying different things than if we're talking to a 15, 16 year old. But talking openly with your children about why you've stopped, or your grandchildren rather, about why you've stopped drinking, what, what are the factors that led to that in terms of health, um, the way you feel when you stop drinking so you actually can model the benefits mm -hmm. that you're now experiencing as a result of no longer drinking so that they can see you as a counterpoint to the other adults in their life. Um, and, and if they're concerned, if the child expresses concern about their parents drinking, then being someone who can listen and talk to them about that and help them to find the right information and, and right sources of support. Um, without knowing too much more about the case, it's hard to say it any more in particular, but I think um, being, a, being a positive example of having fun, coping with stress, dealing with life, all the things that we all have to deal with without alcohol being a factor um, will no doubt have a good influence on the kids. Mm -hmm. So um, the other question I want to ask you, so this is a grandparent who's not drinking, but if, you know, if, you, if kids have parents who are drinking, but the parents want to make sure that they are good role models for the kids, how can the parents ensure that they are good role models? How can they do that? When the parents are drinking? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, as I said earlier, I think communicating honestly with your children when you're drinking um, about whether or not that is something that you are happy, happy about doing or not happy about doing. Um, for parents who 
uh, feeling, oh, I don't really want the children to do to do what I'm doing. I know that my drinking is, I'm drinking more than I should be. I don't, I certainly don't want my kids to do what I do. And I think we saw some examples of that in, in the McAuliffe program with some parents at a party talking about, oh, I don't want them to do what I do. Um, if that's the case, A, I'd encourage those parents to, I'm sorry if you can hear that truck going past my house. I encourage the parents to reflect on their own drinking and the choices that they're making. And if they have strong reasons that they don't want their children to drink, then actually talking to their kids about that. Um, I don't, you know, being able to say, I wish I wasn't drinking as much. I don't want you to do what I'm doing. Um, for grandparents to be able to talk openly about their concerns about drinking. I want to set a good example for you. It's important that I set this good example because, and, and explain concerns about health, um, general fitness and well-being. Uh, feeling feeling confident and, and in control of your behavior and your actions. So not just assuming that children can tell why we're drinking or why we're not drinking, but explaining it to them honestly. Mm -hmm. um, one of the a very powerful experience I had once is actually around smoking, but I think it applies to drinking as well, was when my children were quite young, seeing somebody smoke in the car park at the, at the supermarket and saying, mum, that lady's smoking. Why is she smoking? She, doesn't she know that's bad for her? And, and, I, and then another child piped in and said, but auntie so-and-so smokes. And we had a conversation about, yep, auntie so-and-so smokes. And most people who do that wish that they didn't and actually really want to be able to quit. And the fact that they're still smoking shows us how hard it is and what a, what a challenge it is to overcome. So using that as an example to explain to children, if you are engaging in a behaviour that you, you know, be aware that this is an outcome that can happen before you even start or before you make choices about your drinking or your smoking or whatever. Um, so related to that, I wonder uh, what you would say to uh, parents who, you know, they're drinking because they're stressed out or because, you know, like during this COVID, the pandemic time, uh, a lot of people are drinking to deal with the ongoing stress. Um, but they don't want to do it. So what would you advise to people like that? Like, how can they quit? Well, I think the, the thing to acknowledge there is stress. We are, many, many of us are experiencing stress like never before at the moment. And I like to divide, um, when we look at someone who's drinking for stress, divide that into what's the behavior that you're doing and why are you doing it? So the behavior, the drinking is something we can change. The why we're doing it, for most of us, we can't change too much about what's going on at the moment. Many times people are experiencing stresses that are outside their control. So this need to cope with stress is, is an okay thing. It's okay that you need to cope. It's okay that you're looking for support. It's okay that you're not feeling 100%, particularly in the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment. What we, what we can look at in terms of making some changes is how are you coping? What are you doing? So by acknowledging, yes, I am stressed. Yes, I am getting to the end of the day and wanting to mark that one day has ended before this next day, you know, Groundhog Day starts. Um, there are so many different reasons that people talk about drinking at the moment. Um, so acknowledging that, that this is a valid need, kind of gives us permission, I think, to find a better coping strategy, to own that. So I need to do some self-care. Mm -hmm. So first, acknowledge the reasons why you're drinking. Secondly, think about creatively, what other ways can I cope with stress? And, and for me, it's always about saying, well, what's worked in the past? Because we're all different. I bet you even amongst the people who are on the webinar today, um, what works for me might not work for you. What works for you might not work for me. So think about what's worked in the past. What do you find relaxing? What helps you when you're feeling wound up or overwhelmed? Um, for some people, it'll be getting on the phone, keeping those lines of communication open with friends and family, even though you can't see them face to face. For other people, it might be physical self-care. Um, go for a walk if you can. Have a bath. Uh, mm -hmm. Do some yoga in the lounge room with somebody on the, you know, on the internet. Maybe it's listening to music. Maybe it's engaging in another pleasant activity. But schedule that. Actually, even though we're all time poor, schedule that in the calendar and make sure that you do it. Um, so recognise the need. Try and meet the need in a different way. And then it's like closing the loop. Notice what you did. Consider whether or not it helped. If it didn't help as much as you'd wanted, then maybe add in a different activity, increase the activity that you're doing, um, but acknowledge the role that alcohol is playing in that and try not, if, if you're wanting a drink, ask yourself, why do I want this? If it's for stress, try some of those other things first before you use alcohol as the only coping strategy. Yeah. 
um, Sally, as you were speaking, I just thought that um, if you could recommend some resources for this, we can send it around to our attendees today. Yeah, well, I mean, there are great resources on the Positive Choices website, which I, um, I'm sure everybody has, has got a link to via registering for this particular webinar, but there are resources there specifically for parents. Mm -hmm. There are so many services and uh, resources online for uh, mindfulness meditation, for self-care. Uh, I would suggest just Google those terms rather than thinking I need to go to a specific program. Think about I want self-care of this type and search for it and see what you can find that is available at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, rather than saying, oh, I can't, I can't go outside, I can't do it, I can't go to the movies, I can't do the things I'd normally do, so, so there's mm -hmm. not much there. Look online. Yeah, thank you, Sally. That's really useful for these times. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, so I think Steve would be best place to answer this. Um, Steve, so this question is for you. Um, so what would you say to parents whose children are starting to go to parties? Their parents seem okay with them drinking, but um, yeah, the parents who are sending their kids, they might not be as comfortable. What, what would you say to those parents? Well, I think a, a number of things, um, and, and some of this has been touched on. Um, the, you know, one of the things that we need to do is lots of us enjoy alcohol, but we need to re remind ourselves and our children, it's a drug. It's a drug that people might enjoy, but we need to treat it with much more respect. So I think that that's a starting point. The other things are uh, that have already been said is it is important to talk to our children about what our expectations are. And I think it was Tim mentioned, you know, knowing where your children are, who they're with, negotiating your expectations is, is critical. And, and I use the word negotiating. Um, it's not just about telling, it's also about listening. Mm -hmm. And in, in that process, um, I think what we've got to recognize is that we might want to share what concerns us about alcohol, but we also need to hear what might concern children. And those things aren't always the same. So if I start talking to a child about the risk of liver disease, that might be irrelevant to them. They don't know anybody with liver disease. It's something that's gonna happen in 30 years time. It's, it's, it's not subjectively relevant. Whereas a young person might be as illustrated or mentioned in the, in the, um, the show, and they might be more in, um, influenced by their reputation. And, and so finding out, sharing what you're concerned about is important, but finding out what concerns them. Now, in relation to the, the party, I think, that, that then fits into that. Who are they with? Where are they going? Who's going to be there? Is alcohol going to be available? Mm -hmm. Now, um, in uh, across Australia now, it's actually illegal for anyone else to supply alcohol to your child. So if you're the guardian, if you're the parent or the you know, grandparent who's a guardian, um, you're the only person that can make a decision about whether your child uses alcohol. So one of the things that I've do is find out is alcohol going to be available i contact the parents um, of the other venue that they're going to is alcohol going to be available and i would personally express <laughs> my desire for my daughter or my son that i don't want them drinking and i might even consider if alcohol is going to be there whether that's a safe place for my child to go to because the other thing that we need to remember is Although not every young person drinks, in fact, the majority, as we've heard, don't. And that's important to challenge because a lot of people, a lot of young people overestimate how many of the friends drink and how much they drink, and then they live up to that expectation. So challenging that view that everybody drinks, mm -hmm. um, thinking about uh, uh, not just their own drinking, however, because a lot of young people are not just affected by their own drinking, they're affected by other people's drinking. So talking to a child about how they're going to look after themselves, they may be affected by another adult's drinking. Don't get in a car with somebody who's driving. They may be affected by an older sibling or a friend's drinking. How are you gonna look after yourself? And how are you gonna look after your mates? Talking to children about how they're gonna look after their mates is a really good way of learning how to look after yourself, which isn't quite so confrontational. Mm -hmm. But first and foremost, if my child was going to a party, I'd want to know whether alcohol was going to be there and I'd make sure 
um, I, I'd speak to the other parents and, and I, this happened to me once I rang up and said um, is alcohol going to be there and the mother on the end of the phone says oh there's loads she doesn't need to bring any and I said no you're missing the point here um, I actually don't want my daughter drinking so and I think the laws now give parents it's, it's not so much about um, prosecuting lots of people it's about giving legitimacy to a parent to say hang on a minute and another option might be if there are other children going that you know talk to the other children's parents come up with a, a common view that doesn't make you feel as though you're only you're the only parent who's being miserable mm -hmm. talk to other parents talk to your children about your expectations mm -hmm. know where they are and talk to other parents about what your expectations mm -hmm. are going to be in any situation okay um so this would be in a party situation where there might be a parent but what would you say to parents whose kids are um planning to go on schoolies or any school leavers where parents might not be around or there might not be much adult supervision similar similar process i think talk to your children about what the risks are particularly talk to them about how they might look after themselves and other people and talk to them about what they think the risks might be and talk how they might manage those but i you know it's, it's a little way away at the moment but hopefully the schools are doing something i might be contacting the schools and saying what are you doing to prepare your children for, for leavers um, there are resources around produced in a lot of jurisdictions about some guidelines to, to look after yourself. And then um, again, I'll use more an example. I found out who my children were going with and then talked to some of the other children and talked to them all about what they were going to do, talk to the other parents. And going back to Tim's point, quite a lot of parents will give their children alcohol thinking that that's a way of controlling how much they drink. Um, I was part of a study here in Western Australia where we found that in those circumstances, not only did those children drink what they were given, they drank more on top of it. Those who were given alcohol by their parents drank more. Um, and that's not surprising. Um, the more easily accessible alcohol is and the message that you're communicating by giving alcohol is unlikely there's there's no evidence that giving children alcohol is going to make things better and there's emerging and and, and 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 convincing evidence that it can make things worse so talk to other parents talk to other children talk who are going with your child if they're sharing a house talk to them about how they're going to look after themselves talk to them about your concerns and also have some some people call it harm reduction, but have some strategies in place if somebody gets into difficulty. You might not want your child to drink, but if they do, or if they end up in a circumstance, you want them to be able to call for help. I'd rather my children when they were 17 weren't drinking, um, but I'd also much rather have them phone me up to come and get them if they got into difficulty. So it's not just about saying no, it's about having some strategies in place so that the overwhelming outcome is that your child is looked after. Mm -hmm. um, you just mentioned about uh, alcohol availability in that um, answer. So I just was thinking um, this would be a good question to ask you now. So what would you tell to parents who are concerned about taking their children out to venues like the movie theater or sports, um, a sports event or the, uh, or, you know, an amusement park where alcohol can be bought easily. Um, what would you tell to parents like that? Well, again, it's bringing together a number of things that have been said, but part of our challenge in Australia is um, it's everywhere. Some hairdressers have it, not, not something I'd be familiar with, but um, some hairdressers um, have alcohol available. Um, I've seen butchers have alcohol available mm -hmm. at the cinema, at the gym. Um, and, and so I think uh, from a, a general population point of view, we actually need to start challenging that alcohol should be available 24 hours a day in every possible circumstance. That does contribute to the normalization of alcohol that says everything you do should revolve around alcohol. But in the short term and in relation to um, the immediate issue of your own children, I think as Sally pointed out, I think you talk about that. 
we use those opportunities where we see somebody um, on film or in, in the broad environment to raise the issues about what we might like about alcohol if we do drink, um, but also what our concerns might be for ourselves and for other people. And I think we talk about the need to respect alcohol. Mm -hmm. And I think we should also challenge alcohol. You know, I've been to primary school fates at the end of the year where people are sat around drinking. And I think surely this is not an environment where, and, and drinking to the point of intoxication, mm -hmm. surely we shouldn't be sat around watching primary school children do the end of year Christmas fate and we need a bottle of wine at three in the afternoon. Uh, so I think we should be challenging that with our schools. Um, I, I think alcohol has no place in school environments. Mm -hmm. Children shouldn't be exposed to promotions of alcohol in any shape or form. But I think while that's going on around us, we talk to children about the risks, we talk to children about our concerns, and we use it as an opportunity to talk about and negotiate our expectations for them. Mm -hmm. Um, in this last question that I want to put to you is, um, in your experience, what has been the most successful intervention to reduce parental supply of alcohol to youth? Um, well, I, I don't think there's any single strategy and I don't think the evidence base allows us to. I think it's that combination of talking to your children. I think the, um, Although the evidence is very, very limited about the secondary supply legislation that came in across various jurisdictions, I think that's important in terms of giving legitimacy to parents, giving them a, 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 an option to say, I don't want you supplying. And in fact, it's against the law, so I don't want you doing it. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's also been um, parents, uh, well, one of, if we look at risk factors related to alcohol use in young people, it's availability, it's alcohol promotions, it's um, uh, the way alcohol is supplied or, or consumed in, in uh, homes, it's whether or not a family is supportive or dysfunctional, um, it's vulnerabilities that exist in the community. But when we look at the things that protect young people, um, it's about, you could bring it down to one word, connectedness. Young people who are well connected to school, that's not just turning up, it's being socially and academically engaged. Young people who are well connected to adults, usually parents, but grandparents, aunties, uncles, friends, um, young people who are well connected to um, what some people talk spiritual, but um, what I think that is, it's about being connected to things that are not about material gain. So that might be football, it might be netball, it might be uh, going out to do work in the community, that doing things, being engaged, mm -hmm. being connected. Mm -hmm. um, those would be the sort of things that I'd be looking to, to ensure. Uh, it doesn't put a steel barrier around people, mm -hmm. but I think it, it actually does um, much, it, it, it reduces the risk a great deal. And the other thing I think that we have to do um, in this area is I think we have to challenge and the alcohol promotions that young people are exposed to. We actually have laws in this country and regulation that say children under the age of 18 shouldn't be exposed to alcohol promotions, except when football and cricket and horse racing is on. And really, um, it's very simple. Young people are much more vulnerable to the influences of alcohol. Somebody who's 45 years old, who's been drinking Brand X all their life, is probably not gonna change what they're doing by being exposed to a, um, a Chardonnay advert. But people who are more naive, um, who haven't started drinking yet, they're much more likely to have positive attitudes about alcohol. They're much more likely to have intention to drink. And they're much more likely to drink and drink at risky levels. It's simple we should have a situation where the regulations are adhered to so that children under the age of 18 should not be a, uh, exposed to alcohol promotions in any shape or form at any time. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that was really interesting, Steve. Um, just makes me reflect on um, 
you know, the initial clip that we watched from Sean show and how it said that social media actually is contributing to young people drinking less. But when I think of all the times I have seen alcohol being advertised on social media, um, it's, it's kind of scary to think it's so, it's everywhere. <laughs> Just can't yeah, really escape people, it. <laughs> there are people doing research on this. So I'm my age, I'm much more familiar with the traditional print media or advertising at a bottle shop or advertising on TV. But underneath all of that is a promotion of alcohol and, and, and getting ambassadors to promote it to friends. Um, it's an extraordinary world, which is much harder to challenge. Again, if it's hidden in that way from you as a parent, mm -hmm. then maybe that's an opportunity to talk to children about what is their exposure, what do they think it might be. And that's opening the door then to talk about what your concerns might be. Mm -hmm. And again, as, as Sally said, that, that's about making sure it's age appropriate. Children at the age of five have conceptions of alcohol um and and linking it to intoxicated behavior um there was a lovely study done where they gave them lots of bottles and they got them to organize it into groups and all the alcohol bottles were, were clearly identified as a, as one category of drink um the um so it needs but it needs to be age appropriate what you say to a five-year-old is different from what you might say to a 12-year-old is different from what you might say to a 15 16 year old but it is about having that conversation through the life. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't done that, it's never too late to, to mm -hmm. raise your concerns. Yeah. And it's critically important to remember um, the respect for alcohol. Um, you know, in many states, um, over one child under the age of 18 is transported to an emergency department every day. Mm -hmm. so, um, that's a child under the age of 18. And there's probably others who need to get help, but pe the friends don't want to get them into trouble. Mm -hmm. So the first message is a bit like overdose from heroin. If somebody's over intoxicated, don't say they're snoring and sleeping it off. They're actually struggling to breathe. Mm -hmm. Call for help, get them help. But we need to move to a situation where alcohol is treated with much more respect and we prevent so many young people ending up mm -hmm. in hospital. Um, that's just not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Um, so since Steve mentioned prevention, um, I'll move on to some questions about preventing alcohol-related harm. And starting off these questions with um, what facilities or what services are available for families um, with children who are struggling with alcohol-related harm. Marie, can you tell us about this? Yes, this is um, families with children who are struggling um, with problems with um, alcohol and problems with... Um, yes. Yeah, and alcohol harms. Yes. Um, and look, an awesome place to start to look for some resources, um, which I think Sally mentioned, was the Positive Choices website. So there, there's a fan, there are fantastic resources there. There um, are um, helplines available, and I think hopefully we can pop up in the chat there um, the um, National Alcohol and Other Drugs Hotline, um, and hopefully that'll come up in the chat with the number at the moment. Um, look, the really, really important thing is um, to reach out. If you are a parent with a child struggling with um, alcohol and drugs, absolutely reach out. And there is so much stigma around having prob and admitting that you're having problems with alcohol and drugs that it, you almost have to be a hero to seek help in Australia. So let's not underestimate like how hard it is to reach out. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely reach out. And there are resources there for um, families as well in, um, and um, Positive Choices website again. Um, that said, um, you know, often the challenge, because it's such a good question, because often the challenge is that maybe the person who's having the problem doesn't see that they are having a problem. You're the parent. How can I even start to raise that or start to have that conversation? And, and I think the, very, the most important thing is the way that you start the conversation, that you don't start it with judgment, that you don't start it with, um, with your own fears, that you just um, start and uh, try and open up the conversation 
by expressing how you're feeling about mm -hmm. it. Um, very first step. But mm -hmm. look, it's a, I don't underestimate how hard it is and how heartbreaking it is to see your own child go through problems with drugs mm -hmm. and alcohol. Um, given that children do tend to spend a lot of time at schools as well, so what uh, services or what programs, school-based programs are available for alcohol and other drug prevention? Okay, so now you're asking me about my most favourite topic in the whole world. <laughs> we are absolutely blessed in Australia, despite our complete um, love affair with alcohol, we also understand at least how important it is to do some education in this space. And so every state across the nation, we actually have space in our school curriculum for drug and alcohol education. Mm -hmm. It's, that is just brilliant. But there's two fundamental problems. One, you can't make it boring. Mm -hmm. Two, I think the thing that we've just heard, especially from Steve and from Tim and from Sally, that if a 50-year-old woman, 50-plus-year-old woman like myself, or even a 25-year-old can't come in and tell a 13-year-old what to do, you're ancient. They're not interested in what you're what you're saying. Mm -hmm. So you have to have young people at the cent centre of the education. And we have had just amazing success using digital media, storyboards, cartoons, storylines, working with young people, with education, with teachers to devise drug education that one, is engaging, and two, is actually effective. Mm -hmm. So, um, no more black and white pieces of paper, no more um, very um, old expert um, coming in, M much more make sure you've got the person at the centre and use the digital resources. So I'm hoping they'll be coming up on the chat now mm -hmm. so people can see them. And, um, you know, we've just had schools are really engaging in this space too. We just had 300 schools sign up to um, resources. We call them um, climate schools. 300 schools sign up for these digital online uh, resources that help kids with many of the issues that we've been talking on. About mm -hmm. here um, and of course all the resources on positive choices. I'll stop talking but you can see I could talk for a long time on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other question which is related to this um, and this is more asking your opinion. Do you think or do you believe that the alcohol and other drug learning is covered well enough within the national or state level curriculum at the moment? Well, I think that the level of harm we've been hearing and the level of harm that Sean showed on that show, I think that it, you know, there's a bare minimum there. Of course, I'd love more in that. But hey, let's just, let's make the most of what we've got there. And therefore, um, I know that it is a challenge to feel confident in this area. I know that school curriculums are really, really tight. So let's use the digital way to, uh, of delivering things to make sure that we get it out there. But look, I'd love more, of course, but I think it's just brilliant that it's there in the first place. But yeah. use the effective stuff. Don't waste time on the things that are not working. So on the flip side to uh, what's effective, um, is there anything that teachers teachers should absolutely avoid and not use in schools? The, you know, we, had a, um, we have a lot to learn um, about what not to do from the US. The US pushed really, really hard with just say no messages um, and didn't use young people in the design of programs. And they were spectacular failures. Mm -hmm. Young people are we need to treat them with respect. We need to treat alcohol with respect, but we also need to treat young people with respect and programs that do not treat them with respect mm -hmm. and take, take an attitude that if you were to just to tell young people, no, that will be the solution. They will be and are spectacular mm -hmm. failures. Um, the, the, the challenge really, you know, is how to, um, get young people to make the positive choices, but also um, to be realistic. I think Steve gave the example, you don't want your 16 and 17 year old drinking, but if they did, and if they got into trouble, I would really want their friends or their mates to be looking out for them as well. Mm 
-hmm. So it's, um, yeah, it's really uh, making sure that you come not just from a, a just, na just say no perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and this other question is about uh, what can, like we know that in Australia, within regional and rural areas, as well as within um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, the risk of harm is more uh, from alcohol use. So are there any programs targeted as at these population groups? So um, that was sort of rural, regional, and um, also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, yes. uh, young people. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Look, a lot of most resources um, do get developed in the city, and um, I have seen some questions on the chat. And young people in rural communities experience life very differently to young people in urban areas. So it is critically important that we take into account, um, you know, we asked young people what mattered most of them in, what mattered most of them in cities, what mattered most of them to them in country areas. Community and the natural environment was so much more important, you know, surprise, surprise, in the rural areas. So have there been resources developed for young people around prevention. There are some um, great resources out there, um, in, but we need more mm -hmm. and we need those that have been developed with and by young people. So with and by young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, with and young with and by young um, rural communities. One great resource I know that's coming is called Strong and Deadly Futures and you know, I'd really recommend that people get on and have a look at that. Um, again, it's going, it's being developed evidence-based and it is developed and co-designed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids leading that. So yeah, get on and have a look at Strong and Deadly. I think it's in the chat. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned climate schools, I think. Um, so there's a question about that. So climate schools is endorsed by Victorian Education Department, but it has been difficult for schools um, that the attendee works with to sign up for this program. Um, do you have any suggestions to encourage them? So I'm not 100% sure I got the question there. So I think um, so schools are not signing up to this program. So how can we encourage schools to sign up to Climate Schools, the program? Yeah, um, I think that um, if that question's coming from a, um, a parent or I think the first thing you're doing is attending this webinar, which is great because that's giving you mm -hmm. some information if this is coming from a parent. Um, I think getting online, having a look at the resources. Every school does decide though how they will teach their curriculum. Um, so um, there's a lot of good strategies for us. It's talking to the PE teachers or talking to the teachers. Um, if, it, if it's a, um, a teacher themselves, then get in contact with uh, the climate schools group and, and um, get some examples. More than happy to share them. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for that, Marie. Um, and we've got quite a few live questions now, so I might move on to those live questions now. Um, so this first one, I think, Tim, you'd be best able to answer this. Um, so the question is, parental supply is still prevalent in region, regional and rural areas. Um, so you mentioned a survey in the beginning about parental supply of alcohol. The question is, did your survey capture regional and rural people as well? Yeah, so uh, that survey, um, that study was a um, study of around 2,000 adolescents and their parents who have been tracked over time now, coming up to nine or, or ten years. Um, the the participants were recruited through schools and they were recruited through schools in urban, largely urban areas. It was across Australia in that um, schools were recruited in New South Wales, Tasmania and Western Australia. But we, we can't really um, say a lot about the impacts in regional and rural um, participants because they were probably underrepresented in that particular survey. Um, and as we saw both in the uh, Sean's show 
and what Marie has talked about, there, there are different issues for adolescents in um, regional areas. I think some of the, the general strategies and advice that has been provided here today, though, uh, probably still is relevant and still um, can be given to, to parents of adolescents in regional um, and rural areas. Thank you, Tim. Um, we'll move on to the next question. I'm just mindful of the time. Um, so the next question, I think Steve would be best pleased to answer this. So this question is, I have a, um, my daughter has friends on Instagram and Snapchat and they're constantly posting pictures at parties and drinking and glorifying alcohol. Um, do you know about how social media affects kids drinking? Uh, um, it, 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 there is, emerging evidence about this, but yeah, that sort of exposure um, it really relates for me to the normalization of drinking. So all, if, if all you see is everybody drinking all around you, not just on Snapchat or Instagram, but in your day-to-day -day life. Um, so I, I think that's why it's important to reference back and to have discussions about, well, the majority of you know, challenge those, those, that normalization, the majority of young people don't drink. Mm -hmm. uh, use that maybe um, as long as your children are aware that you're seeing these images on their uh, devices um, use that as an opportunity to talk to them about what do they think about this and what do they think the risks might be and, and gently um, challenging um, uh, some of their perceptions um, helping them challenge their own perceptions Mm -hmm. But I think it's also about, well, if your child's life is revolving around alcohol-related um, friends and opportunities, is there a way in which you can encourage them to um, engage in other things? I know one parent, um, she was worried about her children who were hanging around with other people who were drinking heavily, that, that was becoming the perceived norm. Um, what she actually did was she didn't say, you can't see those people anymore. She got her child involved in uh, circus sports, um, which was something I didn't even know existed. And, um, and she did that because she knew the children were in, uh, interested in it. And she paid for the fees, got them involved. And what happened was they got involved with a number of other peers who had different priorities. So rather than just saying, no, you shouldn't be doing that, finding a way in which you can facilitate involvement in other things that maybe are lower risk, mm -hmm. using it as an opportunity to challenge perceptions about norms and using it as an opportunity to engage in a conversation about what their concerns might be and how they might protect themselves mm -hmm. from those concerns or, or risk of harm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, Sally, this next question is for you. Um, and I will read it verbatim. Um, so it says, because teen alcohol use was more normative among older age groups, that is the baby boomers, do you think there is stigma amongst these cohorts in taking a tough stance on alcohol with their children that is not supplying alcohol to their teenagers? Yeah, look, we do. We hear people say, oh, it didn't hurt me. So it's fine look I grew up all right uh, mm -hmm. in the in the trade we talk about that as cognitive dissonance it's that idea that when my beliefs and my actions or my knowledge and my actions don't match up I feel a bit of a mm, that doesn't make sense I like things to be consistent so I either have to change my thoughts my knowledge or I have to change my actions so if, you know as new evidence and information comes to light that tells us things about drinking that perhaps we weren't aware of back in the 70s um, we have to either take that on board and change our behavior to be consistent with that, or we try and dismiss that knowledge mm -hmm. um, and maintain the behavior we've had all along. What I can tell you from, from working with people um, who have an alcohol use problem is that people are more persuaded by what they hear themselves say than by what other people say to them. Mm -hmm. So no amount of finger wagging and pointing out the error of, of one's ways and those sorts of things is going to make a difference. Instead, I think a gentle and uh, approach that recognizes things were different for particular age groups with single out baby boomers, but uh, you know, lots of age groups had different experiences. Yeah. Um, and, and guide them to recognize their own um, reasons for parenting differently than they were parented, mm -hmm. rather than telling them why they should do it differently. Uh, and I think most people can recognize that our children are growing up in a different 
era than we were or than our parents were mm -hmm. and so things are different and we need to be open so that we can actually explore the evidence mm -hmm. for why why we should parent differently than our parents um, yeah. raised us yeah. uh, and and people won't be open as long as they're being criticized and, and having fingers pointed at them so mm -hmm. from a from a clinician standpoint from a political standpoint an advertising standpoint let's open the conversation mm -hmm. in a way that's not telling people you know you're wrong you should do it this way you should do it that way whether we're talking to our young people or to their parents or to their grandparents for that matter so um you know i, I have heard that opinion expressed you know it didn't hurt me but um that's not the end of the conversation that's the beginning of the conversation yeah definitely i agree sally if, um, if i could just add two things to that that are actually very important in this and sean's program alluded to this there's two very different things from when i grew up drinking the universal uh, the potential for universal reputational damage with 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 these things uh, iphones and uh, mobile phones being able to capture embarrassing uh, moments the unwanted sexual attention that seems to be related to that that can occur when a, people are intoxicated and the other is the evidence about the developing brain which didn't exist um, when i was young and for me you know the conversation i had with my children was look um the, the, you know, it, it, it is a small number of studies, a um, number of them are animal studies. So maybe the journal, you know, the jury is still out on the science. But as a parent, it, con and as it concerns me enough to say, I'd rather you didn't drink for as long as possible. It changed the, the conversation with my children because I just don't want, you can't take the, the, the risks that we're now aware of. The environment in which people are in is different. And I think it's important to acknowledge that. It's not to excuse what I did. It's to say these are different. And I think they're the sort of things that, in fact, young people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so, it's again, it's not about what I did. It's about what you might be concerned about in the here and now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and to, add to that, the reality is that we're not going to be there holding our children's hands every time they're exposed to alcohol. Um, so this conversation starts when they're very young um, about things other than alcohol. It starts with teaching our children how to make good choices. Mm -hmm. And we do that by modeling our own decision-making process, by verbalizing it and saying, oh, should I do this or should I do that? I think I'll do, you know, pantomime almost when they're very little. And then as they get older, including children in decision-making about important choices, explaining to them when you have a dilemma and something you're trying to decide, and then connecting the dots as they get older that you apply that to health behaviors as well like drinking so that they are equipped with the skills to make good choices not just the static knowledge in that minute about what they should do mm -hmm. um we just have two more minutes left so i just thought um to wrap up if all of you could um give like a one-line um answer to what you know what you would say to young people and or to parents about alcohol drinking and how to move ahead with this i guess i can start i think yeah. you know our um being an epidemiologist i'm very much looking at the stats and uh the trends and we've talked a bit about that today um i think it's you know there's some definitely some really good signs of change um but you know, we've still got a long way to go and lots of what we've talked about today will help to address that and uh, you know, help our kids make the best choices that they can possibly make. Thank you, Tim. I would say be aware of the information and make choices about your behavior with, with the available knowledge rather than putting your head in the sand. Treat alcohol with more respect talk to your children about alcohol, talk to them about how they can look after themselves and look after their mates and be prepared to listen and choose your time. It's maybe not best to talk about your concerns at two o'clock in the morning when you've got a glass of whiskey in your hand. That's great advice, Steve. And me last. Oh, I'm yes. going to do that. I'm going to say, you know, I'll, hop on to those positive choices um hop onto that website because a lot of people um, have put some great resources on there from across the country that can address lots of the questions that were asked here today not all of them but um, many of them and if the answer isn't there let us know 
so that we know the questions and the things that we need to be uh, responding to. So hop onto that <laughs> fabulous resource. Yes, thank you, Marie. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists for being part of this uh, great discussion today. And like Marie said, please get on to positive choices. And if you want to send us more questions, which we can relay to our panel of experts from today, we will do so. So please do email us at info at positivechoices.org.au. You can also find all of our panelists on Twitter, I think, except Steve, but you can definitely follow the National Drug Research Institute or Curtin University on Twitter and yeah, you'll be able to see what their re latest research is on and uh, you'll be able to have conversations with them. So thank you once again and hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.